Hey everybody, it's Kent! Kent! The oh. only show that has bonus episodes for $10 on Subscribestar that you should definitely be checking out and that probably doesn't have to sell you anything so there probably won't be a cutaway to any other ads. Today nope. we're talking about me, Digi, and best guy ever. Hello everyone. Are talking about the day I became God! Ah! So we just watched episodes two through five of The Day I Became God, Kamisamani Nata He, having already seen episode one in our seasonal anime podcast. Link over here to go check that out. Um, what do you think, Digi? I like this show. I'm surprised. It was... Uh... We both liked the first episode, and we yep. kind of had the mentality of like, I have no idea where this might go. It's anime original. It's um, kind of unpredictable. Mm. It doesn't have the same pacing as most other shows. So, and when you've got the premise of main character or main girl says she is God, and then there are hints she may in fact be omniscient, yeah. in a it, to to seriously play omniscience is tough to do. Luckily, the show is mostly comedy, so it works. I think they did a great job in that first episode of the, the whole time kicking the can down of whether she is God. The whole episode is like questioning it, then she kind of proves it, and then from then on, um, it, it puts us in this, each episode is kind of like that, in that we find out a situation, she's like, I can do something about it, and everybody's like, really? And then she's like, yeah, really? And then she does something about it, and it gets fun, and... Um, I guess so far it's been largely just episodic. There is this overarching idea that the world is going to end at the end of this month, that the whole, uh, assumably, whole season takes place during. We've, we've powered through the first more than two weeks, more than half of the month, I think. Yeah, I mean, by the end of five episodes, there is 11 days left, yeah. which we're really getting close to the end of the wire. So I don't, I don't Ragnarok is going to descend at that point. And, we, we don't know if this is, if they're going to try to subvert this destiny, if it will mean what it really, what we really think it means. It's hard to yeah. know exactly how it will come out. And for the record, the, it, while it's true that all the predictions of Odin, a.k.a. Hina here, have, like, been correct, it is still possible, in a wacky comedy sense, that everything she says has been coincidence and, like, dumb luck. Uh, like, it, it's true there are things that seem... <laughs> that seem basically impossible unless she was in fact omniscient. Like there's one fight scene, one detail I loved was that there is a fight scene against like this debt collector guy where she had drawn on the floor all these footsteps in numerical order and said, walk along these steps and you will win the fight. And he does so and he wins, which is miraculous. But still, none of it could, it could all theoretically have been done or be accidental luck. She, she could just have, uh, like, maybe she's clairvoyant and can see the future or, like, yeah, maybe. like you said, just has insane luck. But it seems like she is a god. She's probably god. Yeah, considering that, like, well, and there's also some kind of background conspiracy or something being set up. Um, with this hacker guy who might also be a god of some kind. He can, like, stop time and look through monitors and shit. Like, uh, like he does, like, the Shiro, Shiro from Log Horizon thing with all the monitors around him, except for with, like, controlling technology, I guess. Um, the sudden and, like, mind-bending arrival of Super Hakada was absolutely like the biggest weird left turn in the series, despite the fact that we've got God here as like a main character, or Odin or whatever, with these superpowers, or effective superpowers, it really has been sticking to the comedic tone. But when the other, like the short haired like hacker dude shows up, it really gets serious. Like there's a big conspiracy going on and that's gotta be tied into like the overarching story of the end of the world. We have no idea in what way those are connected yet. Probably like a God thing. Why does this guy have such superpowers? Why does he know everything? I don't know. And, and that is setting up that like, I mean, just as a total left turn, maybe our main character girl, uh, Hina and that guy are both like super hacker children with like these crazy like hacking powers like because all this is knowledge it's possible that super duper intelligence could ex well it wouldn't explain everything yeah. I just I it, it, that just was such a weird inclusion that I didn't expect and feels like the harshest insertion into the story so far that I have no idea where it's going and I'm a little scared 
will be shitty because everything else has been really great and the comedic emphasis has been knocking it out of the park yeah. consistently. I would say, and it's hard for me to talk about this and not talk about Jun Maeda, the writer, because he's uh, very famous and infamous. Um, he had written Clannad, Air, and Canon um, for the visual novels for Key. So he built his name off of that. He wrote Angel Beats, and um, he probably wrote Little Busters also. And mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, fucking Charlotte, which was yeah, a very yeah. strange show where the main character becomes a coke addict, I think, at one point. <laughs> um, so like Relatable. The, the shows he writes tend to bounce between like more just like slice of life, characters having fun, usually it's school setting type deal, and like uh, over the top crazy stuff and big dramatic emotional stuff. So going into this show, I was worried that it would sling, like, like that something would happen that would make it all not feel right. Like in the, in the case of Charlotte, that show is tonally kind of similar to this one um, in that it's like a wacky comedy and then it gets serious, but like, when that show gets serious, it does so as like almost a hard cut, like just bam. Now everything is super emotional and sometimes just like the goofiness of the ideas of what's happening take away from the ability to actually take it seriously. Mm. Um, this show has not had that problem so far. In five episodes, it only finally got like emotionally serious in episode five and it was yeah. handled extremely well, very... Mm -hmm. Very well paced. The episode starts funny. It has a good setup for why it's going to get emotional and when it happens. This is an episode where half of the episode is a, a daughter, um, one of the main characters, and her dad sitting and watching um, the dead mom's final like bunch of videos that she had made for the daughter that the dad had been watching for 10 years and being a hikikomori and not because he would not show the videos to his daughter because if you watch them all, you have to delete them. The mom specifically the mom requests to delete them at the end to move yeah. on and forget about her. Yeah. Right. And since he hasn't been able to do that, mm. he wasn't even willing to show the tapes to the daughter and had not even watched them all the way through himself. So, like, the way this scene is paced out, it's so gradual and interesting how, like, the daughter has to kind of break down her dad's defenses as mm. they go through these videos. Just the conversations they have, it all felt really natural and good. And it was like, wow, I actually feel like I'm watching a real thing that could happen. It's a little ridiculous that her dad was a hickey for like 10 years, I guess. I mean, he went to the convenience store and stuff, so it wasn't like a true close. I mean, how many of us have spent like many years just barely going outside and not, you know, engaging My in whole life. stuff? Yeah, th there you go. <laughs> and uh, what made that especially good was I was afraid that we'd kind of get into the, the set. We knew that the dead mom, Izanami's mom was dead, and we'd like, oh, we'll get to that, and it'll be like a big end of series thing we have to deal with, and it won't be that fun. It'll be a big emotional drag. But the fact that the series starts, because the series... The comedy, I, I'll, we'll go back to this, but the fucking comedy is killing it. And the fact that we start the episode with, the, the, the main character's plot is like, I want, this is this thing, as the world's ending, I want Izanami to like return my affection. Because I love her and she's really cute and she's the most pretty girl in school, but she's sad and I gotta break through her shell and get her to love me. And so he, he asks her out in episode one, it doesn't go well, but he's not giving up. He's still trying new stuff and he keeps stumbling, but that's fine. But in episode five, it starts with, the dad is still alive. The dad is the clear insertion point that, that Kamisama here says, okay, here's how you get to her. You got to resolve this family trauma going on in the Izanami household. So here's how you do it. We get to the dad. And like, it's, it's a little cynical to like, oh, I'll solve your family trauma so that I can like date you. But I mean, the show is all played for laughs anyway. So it all comes across, comes across really good naturedly. And the fact that we then get this big, like, goofy scene of he finally convinces the dad to come out of the house after 10 years with, like, I, I, help me get a present for your daughter with strategically her, her birthdays in a few days before the end of the world. How convenient. And uh, they, they finally get him to, to come out with that excuse. And they hit up all these, like, food shops that the dude is so jazzed. But, yeah. oh, my God, they've invented all these new, like, cheese techniques. Yeah, it's the all new food. cheese. Everything they eat is cheese. Uh, I couldn't tell if that was, that he was specifically excited about cheese yeah. or if that was a coincidence. Hard to know. But it was the just cheese, divine inspiration. The cheese I guess, was flowing. But, it, but it's like, this show was doing this so well. It, it takes a joke. It doesn't have to be a clever joke or a brilliant joke, but it takes a thing and it just keeps pushing on it because it's that rule of threes. They go to 
three separate restaurants and all the things, coincidentally, all the foods he's entranced by are all cheese. And then we get the big, what? Everything you like is cheese. Laugh. And we're on to the next joke. It is Jun Maeda. I, don't, I haven't seen much of his work before. The writing is fucking killing it. And I am absolutely loving this shit. Like, uh, like in a previous episode, there's just uh, another like emotional arc in episode three or something where the guy has to help uh, like this girl who just randomly turns out that like the Yakuza is pressuring her because her, her mom is sick and she's running the, the ramen shop right now. So we get this whole big arc where the main character guy under having been given like bits of instruction by the god, just like develops the character of a genius like ramen entrepreneur superstar. He's, he's supposed to be like the, uh, like that, what is it, coffee bot or bar boss or whatever, like the show's Kitchen Nightmares yeah, ripoffs, yeah. basically, mm -hmm. where a guy comes in and is like, yeah, I'm gonna fix your whole shit, you know, and like, he's got this super over-the-top attitude. And the see, voice acting also really clinches a lot it was of humor great. in this show. And so, it's the, the, the crafting of that joke is amazing. It starts with, like, uh, God gives him a pair of glasses as a disguise. He looks exactly the same. Yeah. But he's like, he's wearing a suit, he's got glasses, she'll never be able to tell it's you, bro. It's this balance of like whacking and then it actually works out. So, so that's the first thing. And then he you goes You know what in. it is? It's that yeah. however unbelievable something is, because of the fact that the clairvoyant God is like, no, believe me. Like, yeah. This will work. And then it does. And you go, oh, I guess it had to work. And it she always worked it out. Yeah. <laughs> so they start with that simple little joke, but then they keep going. Next thing is he like is actually making all these really hilarious suggestions, but they work out. And then they, they just keep going with that. But the final big joke at the end is that we get like all of a sudden a backstory for the fictional character that he is playing. Oh, yeah. Where he says like, I am on my 41st birthday now. And we get this joke of like, uh, she says to him like, wow, you're 40? Uh, you could win a baby face contest. I, I already did. did. Yeah. <laughs> like that comes out of nowhere. They're just pushing these jokes as far as they can go. And we get like... The fact that he owns one suit, he's been wearing the suit for 10 years. None of this is true. They're making all this up. We see him surfing in the suit. All that shit is fucking hilarious. And it's just that they craft these jokes in such a way that they don't get boring, they don't get old. We're never gonna see that ramen girl again, but it doesn't matter because all the comedic shit was played so fucking well I mean, the show is fucking killing it. I've been loving every episode. It's just really good situational comedy. And yep. like, it's, it's hard. To even put forth, like, what makes this so good is how not bad it is. Like, the fact that I'm thinking about not just, like, Jun Mai does other work, which usually the problem I had there is that a lot of the comedy was, uh, had nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Like, its characters do funny stuff and then they go have a dramatic moment. Mm -hmm. And this, it's like, well, the, the comedy always revolves around the plot, the actual yeah, yeah. situation. You know, it, it derives from what's going on each episode. Episode four is about, um, Mahjong. Mahjong, yeah. And uh, it starts with he's watching TV. There's a cute presenter girl who the, the, the guy happens to have a crush on, this purple haired girl. The next well, scene. She's like the leader of the like some mega organization that Something like, like that. She, she is probably the final boss of this. Sh like she's, I mean, she's the maybe. one who's. I think she's all done with her narrative already. I, wasn't the, I thought the white haired hacker guy was like working for her. I don't think they have a connection, those two. I think they're separate, but it's just- we, I thought they had something to do with each other. We, he's just, the, the, this, I love, I mean, not to repeat or just like state the jokes too many, but like this one is, is, is fucking brilliant. He's just watching TV, sees a girl he likes on TV. God comments on this, is like, that's interesting that you like that girl. Next scene, she's just playing Mahjong on the computer while he's doing his homework. She turns to him and says, by the way, I've been playing under your name. I just won like a local championship online. You are now entered in a Mahjong tournament run by that lady coincidentally that you were watching on TV. What? Now I'm involved in a tournament? And then he goes and he plays the entire tournament and this actually happens and becomes like a global sensation. That's fucking hilarious. And the way the, the Mahjong game plays out. Now this was probably the hardest scene for us to actually understand yeah. is to people who don't play Mahjong. <laughs> it seemed like he was basically just inventing rules that sound kind of correct and they can, they were praising it as like a new way of playing. It, it seems like an apt comparison is that move, that famous move in Code Geass when Lelouch just did an illegal cheat move yeah. and the narration says, whoa, he's changing the game. <laughs> but that's not how games work. No. Uh, yeah. uh, well, that seems to be the joke continually here. Yeah. This is yeah. one of those where it's like, 
some of it, it's obvious, like, what the joke is in terms of, like, okay, I can tell from the presentation that yeah. he just did something really preposterous. I have to assume that for Mahjong players, this is either the funniest or most frustrating thing they've ever seen in, in the entire world. I assume it isn't well-precedented that you can just say, if it's legal in Uno, it's legal in Mahjong. <laughs> Reverse! Now we go in opposite order. I assume that isn't tourney legal. Right. And he just, he has, he doesn't have, like, a, a reverse card or like no. put anything up in sacrifice for that. He's just like, uh, um, it's your turn again. And they're, what an inventive way to play mod. Just it's pretty fucking ridiculous, but it was entertaining. But again, again, you know, that was a little frustrating. As somebody who liked, well, this doesn't logically make sense. I mean, how are these people? These are professionals. How is he going to go up against them? The fact that it is a comedy series first and foremost is like, okay, that I can relax a little bit. It's not that serious. Yeah. And then the fact that he, he, he wins the tournament with his abstract outside the box play. And the presenter lady, who was the impetus for this whole thing he wanted to meet, comes up to him and in Mahjong pun terms says, how would you like to win the scoring Mahjong tournament with me, big boy? How would oh, you yeah. like to get the ultimate high score in my panties, She bro? literally wants to fuck him she because literally of wants to reinvention fuck. of Mahjong and he turns her down. He's like, I got another girl I like. That Just scene fucking... is hilarious and I actually respect him because he like has a girl he loves and he's not gonna be fucking around on her. I'm so endeared to all these characters. I like every character so far, uh, except Supa Hakada, who Supa I am Hakada. I'm concerned about him. Uh, also, how about the one line? Th this is go back to my theory of maybe this all has a reasonable explanation, that there's one bit where the parents, so at, at the very beginning of episode two, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hina has come to live with them and the parents are just like, it's fine, don't worry about it. It's really unclear still why they're so okay with this, but th there is a scene later on when she's like sleeping in bed or whatever, where they walk in, they're like, ah, is it, is it really gonna be time? Is, is the prophecy really gonna come true or whatever? So either there's some weird family shenanigans going on, which is possible, or like the whole family is gods and this is all part of some conspiracy or something. It's hard to say because they haven't let much information in like yeah. this is uh, you can tell the back end of this show is going to be where most of the plot probably happens yeah uh but there's a lot of yeah like we know the parents are in on it something what is it i don't know are they good guys bad guys is this a good guy or bad guy or we, like don't we don't literally have no idea which is kind of exciting that it like I'm glad more wasn't revealed for what I once. agree. I and agree. This might sound weird for me as somebody who was constantly complaining that ReZero like would well it would well, reveal you know a bunch of stuff that wasn't like progressing forward. This is like yeah. I'm just having a good time watching a comedy yeah. and then yeah. suddenly there's intrigue and I'm, I'm not like, frustrated. Hey, what's that about? I'm not frustrated because it's not like the only good thing about the show is yeah. wanting to find out where the narratives go. First of all, the animation is really good. All the characters look crisp and beautiful. Uh, they got strong colors, and I mean, the main character is just a joy to look at. They clearly put most of the love into animating her wacky reactions and stuff. This show is a joy to look at, is well-written and fucking funny, and I kind of care about where the plot's going, and it's got me hooked to want to know, like, how is this going to resolve? What is going to go on? And I even am kind of emotionally involved, and I felt... I felt a tear in my other eye yeah. at the end of episode five when the, the dad and daughter finally resolved their deep-rooted sadness about their dead mom. That scene was so well done, yeah. and like I know Jun Maeda, if there's one thing he can do, it's make you cry, mm. effectively. Yeah. Yeah. It's done it every every show he's written, I have fucking bawled through. So like, if there's one where I'm going to cry and feel like it was thoroughly earned and like I really cared, and it wasn't just the drama of the presentation, then I gotta say, I'll be stoked. I hope this show stays good. And, yeah, uh, I have yeah. no real reason to think it won't. Like it's been consistently, like you said, well written. Yeah, and that's the yeah. most like wow. It's actually like paced well. It's and just the dialogue even, is funny. Like even if the last episodes are shit, I won't feel like this wasted my time because I all the I was laughing. I was yeah. actually fucking laughing there at the anime. There are memorable gags and episodes. Like yeah. even like even not understanding it, the Mahjong episode on premise alone was very memorable. Just yeah. the idea yeah. of him going in and just making shit up and it working is really funny. You uh, know? It's just it's really working for me in a great way, and I can't wait to see the next thing because I don't think the show is gonna waste my time. It's well written, it's well structured, it happens to look grazing, PA works as always, doing a great fucking job. Yeah man, I can't wait to see more shit. Hell yeah, that's well, it. That's it for this can't hand, but if you want to say can't hand mm. and have it appear at the end of the video, you should submit your can't hand 
either with the hashtag Cantent on Twitter, yeah, uh, to at Cantent on Twitter, or Nate, I think you just set up a Discord account. That's right, everybody. By the time you see this, you should see. I think there will be a public Discord with special places for backers, specifically as a book club, content club style Discord to discuss the shows we talk about and content itself. So click the link below if you want to hang out with your boys and talk about content shit. And again, we are looking for people to submit clips of them saying can. Yeah. Doing the most hype, dope shit that they can be doing. And if you are a special good boy and do a good job, we will put it at the end of the episode in place of the bumper. So join the Discord, submit your fucking clips on Twitter or in the Discord itself, and we will add it to the end bumper. And of course, $10 bonus episodes, everybody. Support the show. Go watch our new Urusei Yatsura Beautiful Dreamer episode. It was a beautiful time. Everybody loved it. And thanks for watching this episode of Cantent. Cantent! See you next time. This could be you. Bye bye. Cantent!